Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this week's webinar. Uh, my name is Damien, and I work with our manufacturer partners, and I will be in the background moderating this week's guest webinar. Um, I think it's pretty safe to say that in a large number of aspects of our design lives and professional lives, where we're constantly trying to find a path to greater efficiency, uh, and this at the highest level is really defined as being a ratio of work performed and compared to the energy expended. Um, today's topic on rainwater harvesting for landscape irrigation certainly explores the efficiency of water use in a larger system and how to make the most of a natural event to grow and improve the landscapes that we are designing. Um, to talk to us all today, I have Mike Warren from Watertronics to present the first of a multi-part series. Uh, and it's a multi-part series because, well, Mike knows what he's talking about and has a great number of years experience in understanding rainwater harvesting systems and, uh, well, as a whole, and the components that make up such a system. Um, all, all of this cannot be imparted in a single webinar session. Um, so please keep that in mind just while listening and, and coming up with questions. Um, we will be having a second part to which I will uh, reference at the very end. Um, but speaking of questions, I'll just quickly go through our usual housekeeping items. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, uh, please type them into the Q&A window. Uh, on your screens, uh, which can be accessed by clicking the Q&A button on your screens, sorry. Uh, some questions will be answered directly by me. Um, otherwise, for the most part, we will likely have a moment uh, to answer questions during the session at some point, um, typically the midpoint, or we will of course have question time at the end uh, for Mike to answer uh, all of these things live. but. From here, I will hand over to Mike to introduce himself a little more and uh, get us underway. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Damien. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, as Damien said, my name is Mike Warren with Watertronics. Uh, I've been in the pump controls and filtration industry for about 16 years now. Um, before that, uh, I was an auto mechanic and as a kid, I was always into you know, cars, snowmobiles, dirt bikes, whatever it was. So um, I've been working with what I call electronically controlled mechanical uh, devices, probably the, the most part of my life and rainwater harvesting systems, pump stations, controls, filtration and treatment all fit in uh, real well for me. So today we are going to go over some of the components of a rainwater system. Um, these systems span multiple disciplines, multiple facets. Um, we're going to focus on surfaces of collection, pre-filtration, and storage tanks in today's webinar. Think of this as the, the first part of a rainwater system. So we'll go over what surfaces are, are good to collect from, which ones to watch out for. Um, then we'll move into pre-filtration, which is a filter before the storage tank, what they look like. Uh, what levels they filter to, how to size them. And then we'll talk about storage tanks, sizing those, which ones are available, some installation uh, issues with each and, and some of the integration that, that goes along with those. And at the end, we'll, we'll give you a, a little insight into uh, the second webinar in our session here, which is gonna cover the, the remainder of the rainwater harvesting system pump controls and, and post filtration and treatment. So with any rainwater system, you are turning the end user or owner into their, their they are becoming the purveyor of their own non potable water system on their property. So the goal with one of these is is to develop the, the collection and distribution system that can take water from a couple of different sources, which we'll review and deliver it uh, to multiple applications. And in our webinar today, we're going to focus on on landscape irrigation. And these systems really need to do that automatically because, again, they're 
they're the purveyor of their own non-potable water source. So much like a city water pump station delivers water to a community, these rainwater systems need to deliver the rainwater to their irrigation system automatically with very little human intervention. So you hear a lot of people in the industry say rainwater, you've heard me say rainwater. Um, I'm also going to, you'll hear me shift and use the term water harvesting because it's more than just rainwater that we're looking at on a commercial property. Um, it is important to identify the different types of water uh, that are available on a property to capture and, and go through the definition of each one of those. So we're going to classify rainwater as water that falls on a rooftop, a hard surface rooftop, and is delivered to a storage tank for collection storage and, and ultimately usage in our irrigation system. Stormwater we're going to define as water that hits a ground surface of some type, so parking lots, sidewalks, hardscape, um, synthetic fields you can collect off of, uh, water that touches a, a ground surface. It is important to distinguish between the two, rainwater and stormwater, because the level of contaminants that you may or may not need to filter out uh, is going to change with those as well. Uh, the third one up here, air conditioning condensate, is also a, another popular source of water to harvest uh, on a commercial property. You, you will see on a lot of large commercial buildings, rooftop air conditioner units, um, there's usually a, uh, a drain line that collects the, the water that condensates on the air conditioning coil there, run right over it actually to the roof drain. So these are some of the, the most popular sources of water um, that we look at collecting uh, in one of, with one of these systems. It's always uh, advantageous to, to use as much water that's available on, on the property uh, as we can. Um, each source can come with its own challenge. Obviously water from a parking lot is going to be a little dirtier than water from a hard surface rooftop, but I want to look at all of our potential uh, sources of collection. Again, the goal is to use a non-potable water supply for a non-potable application, right? Instead of using a potable water supply, a city water, for a non-potable application like landscape irrigation. So when we start looking at developing a water harvesting system, uh, we always want to look at intent. Why is the the end user or the owner, developer of the property, looking to uh, install one of these systems? Are they looking to gain lead accreditation for their building? Um, do they want to be a good steward of the environment? Um, are they looking at doing it as part of a, a stormwater, stormwater mitigation plan? Um, maybe there's a, a local code or a government mandate that uh, is driving their intent. When you look at the intent behind, uh, you know, the owner's request, you'll you'll kind of get a, a better idea of what type of design uh, to move towards. And there's a couple different options as you go through one of these systems. Um, so, for example, somebody that may be uh, investigating a rainwater harvesting system on their property because, say, local code may. Uh, be enforcing it, they may be looking at a small system that just satisfies the requirement to, to obtain their permit versus somebody who's going for the maximum number of lead points or a person who's a, a good steward of the environment and they want to, you know, collect as much water as possible um, regardless of the cost. Uh, so the drivers behind each of them are different. Step two is checking out the budget. Um, budget ends up driving a lot of decisions uh, with the design of rainwater harvesting systems because there are a few components that have the potential to have a very high cost impact on the property, storage tanks being one of them. Um, usually you'll hear some end users and developers mention that you know they don't really have a budget in mind um, but they want to see how much it costs. Usually there, there's a number and if you can get the number ahead of time, it, it drastically improves your, your design. But 
after you figure out the intent and, and what their approximate budget is, you can start to put the pieces together and develop the solution. Um, the single most important piece of advice on developing the solution for a rainwater harvesting system is try and, and source everything from a, a single source provider or designer of the system. Uh, these encompass multiple disciplines, both in the design phase sometimes, as well as the construction phase. Uh, you can have civil, uh, plumbing, irrigation, electrical, um, depending on if your tank is outside above ground or if your pump station is outdoors above ground versus indoors in a mechanical room. Um, every one of these components is dependent and, and interconnected to the other. So the pump station is connected to the tank. The pre-filter has, has an effect on your surface of collection as well as the storage tank size. They're all interrelated. Um, so keeping, keeping everything together as much as possible in the specification and the design side of things drastically improves the project's success uh, as it goes out to bid and ultimately construction. <laughs> So no matter what we're doing, whether we're capturing rainwater from a rooftop or stormwater from a parking lot, um, we're gonna follow a, a general process flow with a water harvesting system. The first step is we're gonna end up capturing the water from somewhere, again, rooftop, parking lot, air conditioning, condensate, whatever we have available on our given property. Then we are going to start filtering the water before it hits the storage tank. So there's a filter located between the surface of collection and the storage tank. <clears throat> the, the sooner we start filtering the water in the process, the less time, money, and effort we're gonna spend on filtering and treating the water downstream. <clears throat> Next, we're gonna have to store that water after we've filtered it. So it's gonna be in some type of vessel, whether that's above ground tanks, below ground tanks, something cast into the building foundation. And then the last three here will lump into our final component, pump controls and, and post filtration. This is your heart of the, the water harvesting system. This is the where the passive components like pre filtered and storage tanks end and your moving machinery starts. So this is where you see information about your system flow, pressure, tank level, the additional steps to get the water to the desired quality for its end usage. So this next bit of information here, the way I can graphically represent uh, what goes through my head when we start looking at one of these systems. So across the top of the screen, you have your multiple water sources that may be available on your, on your property. And we're gonna navigate through one or multiple of these bubbles to get to our end usage at the bottom of the screen here. So today we're, we're focusing on uh, a landscape irrigation application. So we're gonna take a look at either rainwater or stormwater air conditioning condensate as our, our three most popular uh, water sources for landscape irrigation application. And we're gonna navigate through one or a few of these bubbles to get to our end usage at the bottom. So let's take a very simple system that collects from rainwater from the rooftop. We're gonna come down through a pre-filter before our storage tank. We're gonna come into our storage tank and we are gonna pump out of our storage tank through, let's just say we're doing a, a drip irrigation application, which is gonna require only a, a screen filter of some type to about a hundred micron before we can get to our end usage. Along the way, we're gonna make some decisions. Um, this pump is gonna pump water out of our storage tank. We're gonna to need to make a decision on what we're gonna do when we don't have rainwater available. Maybe it hasn't rained in a while. Maybe we've used all our rainwater. So we're gonna to have to decide if we're gonna integrate a backup water supply of some kind. 99% of the time it ends up being from the city source. And we're gonna to have to decide if that backup water supply is gonna go into our storage tank to replenish it some, or we're gonna send that backup water supply direct to our distribution system, our irrigation mainline. 
we're going to have to control all this equipment with some type of master control panel that's going to run the pump and motor sensors and all the other treatment devices. Um, that control panel may also need to be connected to the building management system or some external monitoring uh, source on the property. So multiple moving parts, but again, uh, we want to evaluate what sources of water we have available to get to our end use. So there are a couple, couple of these water sources at the top highlighted in red. Um, it's important to review those briefly. This one in the top middle here that says cooling tower. This refers to cooling tower blowdown water. Uh, I've had some developers uh, ask about using this water for landscape irrigation. Um, you want to raise the red flag if, if that comes up. So cooling towers on commercial properties take in city water uh, and it's used to in, in a cool uh, heat removal process. But inside this cooling tower, they inject things for uh, maybe disinfection, uh, anti-scalant, uh, the, the general operation of a cooling tower consumes water. It loses water in its process. So the H2O evaporates, but any of your, your minerals in your water, calcium, iron, uh, any of those chemicals that they injected in there remain behind because they don't evaporate. And over time, they, they purge their tower. So they have this slug of water that they discard. Um, and it's some sometimes you may want to try and use that for an irrigation application however it has a super high total dissolved solids concentration along with some chemicals in it so it's important to to note that it may not be a good water or suitable for irrigation or plant life because of the super high tds level and the potential for chemicals in it um, the other one up here on the right is gray water. Gray water is classified as discharge from sinks, showers, and laundry. So when you go to look at that water source being used for a landscape irrigation application, it's, it can be done. However, it requires a much higher level of filtration than say a rainwater or a stormwater system. Because if you think about anything that goes down your sink drain, or comes out of your laundry machine is going to be in your storage tank. So things like soaps, toothpaste, you name it, it's going to be something we're going to have to filter out on the other end. So our three main components of a rainwater system, we have our storage tank, and then our pump controls and treatment system down here. So we'll walk through the flow of water briefly here. This pipe on the upper right hand corner is from the rooftop. Water will go through the pre-filter into the storage tank. Dirty water or overflow from the pre-filter will go out to the left here. This overflow pipe on the tank will comes out the back and runs horizontally here and this pipe heads to the storm drain connection in the street. The inlet of the pump station is in the bottom middle section here and then our distribution piping to our irrigation main line starts right here uh, in the lower left portion of the screen. So again three components pre-filter, storage tank, and a pump station with post filtration and treatment if required. So rainwater systems are going to have these three components and depending on what site that you're at, they are just going to get moved around the property. So sometimes the tank will be above ground, sometimes the tank will be below ground, sometimes the pre-filter will be installed in an above grade situation like this, sometimes it'll be uh, installed buried in the dirt and the pump station may be inside a mechanical room like shown here or it may be located outdoors. So let's take a look at another example. So here's a diagram of a below ground option where we have our pre-filter 
in the below grade vault on the left here. Is in the tank, and our controls post filtration and treatment are above grade here in the mechanical room. Again, same three components, just located and differently uh, on the property depending on what the, the site conditions are. So let's take a little deeper dive into the first component, uh, the pre filter. Again, the best way to filter the water is at the source. Um, nothing will affect your water quality in your storage tank like decomposing organics in the water. So leaves, sticks, debris of any kind, we want to keep those out of the storage tank as, as much as possible. So this filter that's between the, the collection surface and the storage tank ends up being a, a essentially a stainless steel screen. So it's going to remove what's called suspended solids or TSS, total suspended solids. There are other types of filters that are called hydrodynamic separators, which remove TSS, but also have a oil water separation component to them as well. So that is pictured on the lower right hand side here. You will use this type of filter if you're collecting from a uh, a parking lot where you have the potential uh, for that oil hydrocarbon component. All rainwater filters have three connections on them. So there's one inlet and two outlets. So in this photo in the lower left hand corner here we have our pipe from the roof, our screen filter here, the lower left hand pipe here is clean filtered water to the storage tank and the lower right hand pipe here is our dirty water or overflow pipe. Rainwater filters have one inlet and two outlets on them because they're installed in drainage piping systems and you can never back up the drainage piping uh, from a building. The, the goal is to evacuate the water off the roof. We need to get the weight of that water off the roof uh, for safety purposes and then convey it away from the building uh, to keep the foundation intact. So given that there are only, you only have gravity in these filtration systems, they work on an efficiency principle. So your pipe sizes are fixed. So as you, you can picture depending on your rainfall intensity at any given point in time in inches per hour over your given collection surface square footage, the harder it rains, the more flow rate you have in this pipe coming into the filter. So they have a curve, an efficiency curve, much like a pump curve does. So as flow rate increases in this pipe, coming into the filter, the velocity of the water is going to increase. It's going to move faster. So the faster the water is moving, the less time it is over the actual screen, which means the less time gravity has to act upon it to pull it through the screen and send it as filtered water to the storage tank. <laughs> the other reason you see these filters with one inlet and two outlets is the drainage system will need to function 100% as normal if the filter is completely occluded or plugged for any reason. So let's say this filter here had a plastic bag stuck over it. If this filter just had one inlet and one outlet and the, and the screen was occluded, the whole drainage system would back up on the roof. The third pipe on the filter allows the water to go right over the screen and head right to the storm drain connection, just as if the filter were never installed in the piping system. So again, one inlet and two outlets, and most of them are just configured uh, differently between the types of filters that are out there. This one in the middle here has one inlet here, one outlet is on the bottom, and the other outlet is on the back side of it. Some of these have optional spray heads that you can connect pressurized water source from them, usually from the pump station. Uh, and it'll go off on a, a time of day type clock where say every day at noon or 2 a.m. It, it'll run the spray head for 
for a few minutes. Hydrodynamic separators uh, are slightly different. They have one in and one outlet, but they have a treatment flow rate and a weir inside. So if the screen ever becomes plugged or there's, or you exceed the treatment flow rate in them, it bypasses the screen and treatment device completely and heads out to the storm drainage connection as if the filter were never installed. Uh, the one maintenance difference uh, between these types of filters and a hydrodynamic separator is that these filters, again, have that automatic spray head potentially, or you just remove the screen once a month or every other month and clean it. Whereas the hydrodynamic separator will collect the debris in the bottom and you need to have a vac truck come in periodically and vacuum out the solids. <clears throat> the filtration level uh, in rainwater filters is they're all generally around 350 micron. Uh, because you don't have a pressurized water source pushing that water through the screen, you only have gravity, uh, the power of gravity to pull the water through the screen. You can't really order them with, with smaller screen sizes, say like a 100 micron screen, um, because the, the, the force of gravity isn't enough to break the surface tension in the water and actually pull the water uh, through the screen. So 350 micron is about as small as you can, can get with these from a screen filtration aspect. Uh, they come in various sizes, you know, everything from residential systems that have, you know, three inch, four inch uh, pipe connections on them to commercial ones that, that are available in six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, and even up into to 20 plus inch pipe. So again, it's important to figure out uh, you know, what size piping that these are going into and the, the flow rate uh, that will be, that you anticipate in your piping system to, to size them. Just like any other filter out there, they're sized on, on flow rate. So flow rate from a collection surface is, is based on rainfall intensity in inches per hour. So it's not, a volumetric measurement. It's not one inch of rain or two inches of rain. It's, it's the rainfall rate at any given point in time. And there's a, a pretty simple equation to, to figure that out. So let's just say we have a rainfall rate uh, right now of 1.2 inches per hour. If we divide that by 12, that gives us feet per hour. If we multiply that number by our collection area square footage that will give us cubic feet per hour and if you multiply by the conversion factor of 0.1247 that will convert it to gallons per minute. Um, if any of you need that equation uh, feel free to email me later or email Damien um, and we can write that down for you but again cubic feet per hour essentially multiplied by 0.1247 will convert it to gallons per minute. And then again, the filters will have a, depending on which filter you're looking at, will have an efficiency curve that'll look much like a pump curve. And you want to size them for <clears throat> somewhere around 90% uh, efficiency based on the flow rate that you're, you're calculating. And to determine that, that rainfall in intensity, uh, you're going to, you're going to look at what are called uh, average rainfall uh, return rates or, or intensity rates per year. So there's such a thing as say uh, an event that happens, you know, once in five years, once in 10 years, once in a hundred years. Uh, you'll find that the piping system on a building is probably sized quite large because it's sized to handle something that's going to happen, a large storm event once in 50 years or, or a hundred year storm you may or may not want to purchase a filter for a flow rate that's going to happen once in a hundred years. So there's a little different uh, thought on your drainage piping design uh, and your filter sizing depending on, on the rainfall intensity rate you need to size for. So a few more examples here again they can be installed above grade 
or below grade. This example on the right hand side here is actually this filter right here. So one inlet and two outlets. We have the main pipe from the roof. Here there are two of them installed in parallel because the flow rate from the roof exceeded one filter's capacity at its efficiency rating. So they're two plumbed in parallel. Water from the rooftop enters the filter here, goes through the screen. Clean filtered water is sent back through this pipe. The storage tank is actually on the other side of this concrete wall. This is a below ground parking deck. So on the other side of this wall, there is uh, dirt where the tank is buried and the dirty water or overflow from the filter comes out the other side and heads through the wall. This pipe actually connects up with the tank overflow pipe outside in the dirt and it heads uh, to the uh, storm sewer connection in the street. The photograph on the left here is the same type of filter just shown in uh, direct bury application. So all this piping is buried in the dirt and this particular customer has four of these filters uh, plumbed in parallel. So again, why is pre-filtration important? Uh, because there's all kinds of debris, small and large, that, that can be on collection surfaces. And we want to keep as much debris out of the storage tank as possible to, so we have the best quality of water to work with. <clears throat> Example on the lower right-hand side here, uh, this is the inside of a below ground tank that was installed at a, a car dealership, uh, I believe somewhere on the East Coast where uh, they, the system did not have pre-filters on it. Uh, there weren't too many trees above the roof line or anything like that, but there's still uh, debris that can get in the storage tank and settle in there over time. So after about two, two and a half years, uh, there was a wiring problem with this pump and motor and the service provider ended up draining the tank uh, to go down there and repair it. But this photograph here shows you what ac accumulated in the tank um, over construction type scenario. Um, you can even take it one step further and, and say that pre-filtration definitely starts at the rooftop, right? At the, the point of entry. Uh, for your water. So having uh, roof drain grates or, or gutter guards or anything is, is important as well, just to keep that organic matter out of the storage tank. Parking lots, this becomes even, even more important because just the nature that a parking lot is lower than a roof surface and everything, you know, washes downhill um, and the, the storm drain grates and everything in a parking lot are, are larger and larger debris can get through them. Um, it's definitely uh, important to have a, a pre-filtration conversation with the design team because you can, again, as you can see from the photo here, get all kinds of, of debris, which we definitely want to keep out of a, out of a storage tank. A couple other surfaces that are that are out there. Um, green roofs um, pose uh, their own unique challenge. So if you're familiar with a green roof, it is uh, a rooftop on a building that has some type of, of soil or media or, or vegetation growing on it. So when you have rainfall on these types of roofs, it runs through that media and then picks up the tannins and, and other things that are, that are in that media and it will give the water a, a color, as you can see in the upper right hand corner here. So this color isn't something that can be filtered out because it is dissolved in the water. So earlier we talked about 
pre-filters removing suspended solids or TSS, total suspended solids. You can remove solids with screen filters just because the solid itself is larger than the aperture opening in the screen. Therefore, it will act as a barrier, keep the solid uh, from passing through the screen. Stuff that's dissolved in water, you cannot filter out with screen filtration, whether that be pre-filtration before the tank or automatic screen filtration on the pressurized side of the pump. So again, anything your water touches on its way to the storage tank has the potential to negatively impact your water quality. Now, <clears throat> when you start looking at collecting from a green roof, if we were just using uh, water collected from a green roof for say a drip irrigation application, um, we would be totally okay with having the water you know, have a, to be a, get pumped out of that storage tank through an irrigation main line directly to a drip emitter, which is basically installed uh, in the dirt or, or at ground level in the irrigation system. So there's no real risk or, or harm in uh, the water having a, a color to it. There's not uh, a public health concern. We're not aspirating uh, the water through the air or spraying it at uh, a building or a sidewalk or anything like that. But if we do have a, a spray irrigation application and, and our surface of collection is, is organic, um, or if you see in the photo on the, the left-hand side here, has uh, rock ballast on the top of it, even if the specifications for the roof say that the, the rock must be clean and washed, uh, you can see that there's just general uh, silt and moisture and muck below the rock that if, you, if it rains on this roof here, it will give your water a, a slight color on its way to, to the storage tank. <clears throat> the last surface of collection we'll talk about today is from a splash pad. So I kind of call this uh, potable water recycling in a way. Uh, you'll have children's splash pads where they'll be connected to city water and they're interactive fountains of some kind that'll be on so let's just, for example, say from noon to four every day when it's over 75 degrees. So those splash pads are connected to city water because that water will come in contact with human beings. So it needs to be safe for public health. But instead of letting that water drain through the splash pad and go to sanitary or the storm drain, wherever it may go, um, you can collect that water um, and use it as a very high quality water source to irrigate, say, the same park uh, that the splash pad is in. So this, these systems generally end up being uh, below ground tanks. This particular site here, you can see the, the concrete splash pad right here. There is a below ground storage tank buried underneath this lawn surface here and the pump station that's connected to the irrigation main line is right here. So the water from the, <clears throat> from the pressurized side of the pump coming in through here, through a filter for irrigation and then out to the irrigation main line. So moving into our next component in our rainwater system, storage tanks. <coughs> hey Mike, uh, yes, sorry, we, we just have a few questions in relation to the pre-filtration stuff. I, I thought this would be a good time to, uh, to drop those in. Um, getting right into sure. those, uh, and you may have mentioned uh, some notes on these already but uh, what kind of maintenance is required for the pre-filter uh, and what medium is used for that uh, pre-filter? So most, or I'm gonna say all pre-filters are, <clears throat> they have a, some type of stainless steel screen in them. So, <clears throat> excuse me. If you do not have a pre-filter that has an automatic spray head on it, and it's just something you are going to manually clean. Generally, you want to pull this screen out of this filter once a month, or as you get to know your system better, maybe every other month, and you generally just wash it off with a hose. 
uh, and a cloth if need be, spray whatever debris on it off the screen and then reinstall the screen into the filter. Um, the hydrodynamic separators collect the debris in the, the bottom of them. Um, these you generally will need a, a vac truck to come in and vacuum the debris out of them. And you could start at a once a month type interval, but as you get to know your system and your dirt load, it, it may only be once a season. Um, again, it depends on, on the surface of collection and how much debris you're collecting quickly. Okay, and in regards to this uh, type of uh, pre-filtration, is there a particular recommendation for a type uh, for parking lots? Yep, if you're gonna collect water from a parking lot, I would recommend something like a hydrodynamic separator that has both a suspended solids removable removal component to it and an oil water separation component because you are collecting from a parking lot that's either made out of asphalt or has cars that leak oil on the, the parking lot surface. It's good to have, uh, again, TSS removal and oil water separation. Uh, great. And the last one for this little uh, section is your experience with uh, issues with pH, either too acidic or too alkaline. Um, any kind of comments there on how to deal with that? Um, I have watched generally find rainwater coming in around the the six on the on the pH scale. Um, depending on where you are in the country, I'm sure that varies some. There are different different states do have different regulations with the type of piping that they're uh, re will require to use on the distribution side. We see this more in, in a plumbing scenario where maybe we're using rainwater for uh, flushing toilets or a wash system or a cooling tower. Um, I don't see it much in the irrigation side of the business because in 99% of the time that irrigation distribution piping, the irrigation mainline is is made out of PVC or, or some type of uh, non-corrosive material like HDPE uh, that really isn't affected by uh, pH of the water. Um, pump stations in general um, are either made out of Schedule 40 steel pipe or uh, some are made out of uh, PVC. Um, a few might have copper, but um, in general the, the pH of the rainwater isn't so acidic, like down in the, the four range where it would uh, drastically uh, eat away a, a metal material very quickly. Uh, no worries. Uh, we'll leave it at that for now and, and let you uh, continue on to the storage component and we'll uh, have some questions towards the end. Okay. <clears throat> so storage in the system can be anything that'll hold or retain water, right? tanks, ponds, uh, above ground, below ground, stuff cast into the building foundation. <clears throat> um, one installation note about below ground vessels. If you are gonna bury something in the ground, it's very important to evaluate the, the groundwater elevation at the time, because um, you, you need to ask yourself, <clears throat> what would happen if we had a, an empty tank and a completely flooded hole or excavation or, or area that the tank is in. Um, they will pop right out of the ground if the, the force in the, in the upward direction is greater than the force in the downward direction. Um, I like to think of anchoring for below ground tanks as, as cheap insurance. Um, there may not be groundwater present now at the time of installation, but you never know what's gonna happen five, 10, 15, 20 years from now. Um, most of the tanks that <clears throat> are going in the ground are gonna be around longer than most of us uh, anyways. So I see anchoring them as uh, definitely as, as cheap insurance. So I threw some photos up here, the most popular ones that I've seen uh, around the country. There's probably five or six more variations uh, that are out there, but 
Uh, the one on the left here is an above ground corrugated uh, example. So these use a, uh, a PVC liner on the inside of the storage tank to actually hold the water and penetrations are either made through the bottom of the concrete slab or in the sidewall of the tank. The one in the middle here, um, these are FRP tanks, fiberglass reinforced plastic. These come out of the diesel and gas industry. Um, so the EPA lets them use diesel and gas in these tanks. We can for sure use them to, to hold water. Um, very commercial grade uh, can be designed for H20 traffic load ratings. Uh, you can put penetrations anywhere in any direction on them that you need. Uh, they have anchoring kits available, very highly engineered, and the engineered documentation uh, very well supported on them as well. Uh, on the right hand side here, these are your above ground high density polyethylene tanks, very cost effective. Um, come in a wide variety of sizes. Uh, the penetrations are usually done uh, on site or at a factory. Um, and you, need, you either need to purchase bulkheads or, or weld physical high density polyethylene pipe in the directions that you, in sizes that you need on them. Um, one more thing with above ground tanks, if you're installing a storage tank outdoors, it's important to limit sunlight uh, into the tank as much as possible. So putting a white tank outdoors is probably not the best idea. You wanna buy one that's black or dark green. Um, and this is to, to limit algae growth. So <clears throat> warmer water um, has the potential, potential to have an algae bloom in it. So algae can't grow without sunlight. So if you limit the sunlight in the tank, you drastically reduce your potential for algae growth in your tank. Uh, below ground tanks really don't have that concern. They're at a constant 50, 55 degrees for the most part um, and zero sunlight in them. <clears throat> so when you look at sizing a storage tank, um, it's usually like a four part equation. And there's two ways to look at it. There's the water conservation viewpoint in sizing a tank and then there's the storm water mitigation uh, viewpoint. Today we're gonna talk about the water conservation viewpoint because I believe in a landscape irrigation application that's that's I find that's usually the driver. We're going to use rainwater for our irrigation system so we can reduce our dependency or reduce how much city water we're using. So we're looking to conserve that precious resource that is city water. So when you look at sizing a storage tank I always say you don't know how much you need to store until you know how much you are consuming. So you need to figure out from a volumetric standpoint how much water <clears throat> per day or per week is my irrigation system going to need given, given no rain. So if it does not rain at all, how much water would I need to give my plants for them to survive? So that's how much water we're consuming. And then we need to look at our potential of collection, right? So this is our collection surface area, our roof area compiled with our weather data in our job site location. And what happens is it ends up being a mass balance equation. The tank ends up being the buffer between what you can produce versus what you need to provide. And the, the in the tanks, the buffer. <clears throat> so it's important to look at it from a daily or weekly perspective because you need to incorporate the, the variation or the seasonality of the rain events. So if you just, if you looked at it from a whole month perspective saying, well, I need to put down a hundred thousand gallons of water in a month and it's gonna rain four inches this month and four inches over my surface area equals uh, whatever, whatever is 80,000 gallons, you know, I'll be uh, in a 20,000 gallon deficit. Um, it's not accurate enough because you don't know when the rainfall is going to happen. So what I'd like to do is just build a simple spreadsheet that's addition and subtraction 
per day. So you can never predict the future. So you don't know what your next year's weather pattern is going to be or the year after. But what you can do is look back and take an average year in history, pull the, the rainfall data from NOAA or Weatherbug or any one of those sites has precip data for every day of the year in, in years in history. So pick an average year um, and then extrapolate your weather data over your roof area, which will produce X number of gallons. And then you know how much your irrigation system is going to pull out per day and just do a simple addition and subtraction equation and you will have your tank volume uh, on a day by day type basis in order to show your client um, you know what would have happened say had you had the system installed two years ago or three years ago <clears throat> there are some overarching constraints um, so you may do some math and, and figure it out and say that, well, we definitely need a 30,000 gallon tank to run you know, 80, 90% of our system on rainwater. Uh, however, the client only has a budget for you know, a 5,000 gallon tank. So that'll drastically throw your equation off. Um, there may be a, a local code requirement that says, well, you got to capture at least the first inch of water that falls over you know, the square footage. So even though you need a, a smaller tank, you're going to end up purchasing a minimum of say 20,000 gallon tank. Um, there are a couple other geographical factors that will play into it as well. So the end usage amount and the end usage pattern will also affect your tank size. So if you're in an area of the country where it only rains a couple of months and it's dry the remainder of the year, you're gonna be in a little different scenario where you're looking at capturing as much as you can for a short period. And then is that gonna sustain you for your irrigation season or, or how much, you know, how much of your irrigation season is it gonna sustain you? Um, the other th important caveat to note when sizing tanks for an irrigation application is you actually only need to store the amount of water for your plants to get you between the natural rain events. Because if it rained and all your planting is outside, the natural rainfall did your irrigation for the day. So you need to adjust your numbers slightly um, to accommodate for the rainfall data or adjust them for say a smart irrigation controller. Something that's gonna make an irrigation decision on ET or it's going to have a rain sensor and know to stop irrigating when it rains um, versus just a, a time of day. And if anybody wants more info on that, um, you know, how to set up one of those spreadsheets or just to talk more in depth about it, because it is, it is hard to convey over, um, over a, a webinar here because there's it's a little bit of complexity to it. I'm happy to, to, to talk through that in more detail if anybody needs. <laughs> So lastly, we'll talk about integrating some of the uh, components. Um, one of the first things that you're probably gonna have to do is, is monitor the level in that tank somehow. Um, a lot of these systems also use submersible pumps uh, in the storage tanks. So we'll just take a look at one of the more uh, typical applications here where there is a pump in the tank as well as level sensing uh, items in the storage tank. So we can see on the screen here that we have a submersible pump that's going to pump up and go horizontally over to our filtration and control skid over here. And this may be outdoors, it may be indoors, um, wherever it, it may be. Um, and then our level sensing equipment is also going to need to come up and exit our tank uh, and get back to our, our main control system. So what this means from a design and install standpoint is that there are three, essentially three pipes or devices that are running from wherever this tank is to wherever the control system is. So 
obviously we need to get the water from here to here because our irrigation main line is going to start on the other side of this device. So we need a pipe from here to here. We have a motor that's in here that's going to run on what we call some type of high voltage, right? 208, 234, 60 volts, single or three phase power. And then we have level sensing devices, whether they be floats or level transducers that are going to run on low voltage power, usually you know, 12, 24 volts DC. So we need to make sure from a, a an infrastructure standpoint that there is provisions to get the pipe, obviously, over here, but two conduits for electrical items from wherever the storage tank is over to our our pump control and treatment panel. You can't run the low voltage level sensing wires in the same conduit as the motor wires. Um, when you turn the motor on, the high voltage will induce over onto the low voltage wires and you will all of a sudden get, say, a low level alarm, even though your tank is full, it it it, it goofs up the inputs um, on pump stations when you put low voltage wire in the same conduit as high voltage wire. Um, it's a pretty, believe it or not, it's a pretty common thing that happens, um, even though National Electric Code really doesn't let you do it, but it, it happens a lot. So that's probably one of the most important integration uh, comments that I have as far as integrating items into storage tanks. If you have an above ground storage tank application, say for example, like this one here where the pump station sits next to the storage tank, the pump and motor is physically in this enclosure. So you only have low voltage level sensing equipment that will come from the tank and need to get landed over at your pump control and treatment device. So that wraps up um, part one of our webinar series, you know, collection surfaces, prefiltration and storage tanks. Um, you can probably see a, a little bit of the, the future pump controls and post filtration and treatment stuff uh, uh, working its way in there. We talked a little bit about it, but um, I'll toss it back over to Damien um, for any more questions. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, we do have a few. Um, is it safe to use filtered roof water to top off a pool? I don't know if I know that answer. Um, the logical side of me says we swim in lakes and rivers and we're okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, I, I don't know if I can answer that one. Um, I suppose it comes down to uh, some, oh, I guess a number of factors, but really, uh, really this, the, the level of filtration that, that goes into uh, to that that roof water and and some maybe other environmental factors um, yeah. you know. and your pool has probably a chlorine disinfection component into it as well yeah uh, that's it's an interesting interesting question but uh, I hope that uh, maybe is is a point of further discussion um, outside of the webinar but uh, yeah the other question um, one other question we have is how do you address freezing in uh, northern climates, northern climates? So I suppose that's more of a, um, a northern hemisphere question, but uh, yeah, I think. So if you have um, an above ground storage application in the northern part, the northern hemisphere here, um, we are seeing that along with the irrigation system, and pump station that's that's drained and blown out, blow, blown out with an air compressor. Uh, the storage tanks are are drained, and you will see. I can't quite see it in this photograph here, but there will be a like a manual bypass valve uh, on the inlet of the storage tank that they will close during winter. Um, and that the valve will close and there'll just be a pipe that runs upstream of that valve, like right over to the tank overflow pipe. So that if you did get any um, minor snow melt or anything 
during the winter months while the, the irrigation system and, and pump station is winterized and the tanks are winterized, it would just go right around the storage tanks. Um, I have seen some people put heaters in above ground storage tanks, but as far as what size and how many, <coughs> um, there's no real easy equation for that. Um, in my head at least, because there's just so many variables, you know, are you in North Dakota where it's going to hit minus 30 degrees Fahrenheit without the wind chill or, you know, are you in Tennessee where it may dip in the 20s, maybe a little cooler uh, for a very short period uh, during the winter months of the year. So um, if you have a below ground situation, um, if your tank is about three feet or or lower in the ground or have three feet or more of cover over the top of the tank, um, the temperature of the earth is gonna keep the water in the tank from freezing. Um, I live just outside of Milwaukee in Wisconsin. Um, and I can tell you that we have winter months that hit you know, minus 20, minus 25 degrees here. Um, and we have some tanks locally that are installed three to four feet down and um, none of them have frozen around here. Okay, great. Yeah, uh, there was a, a related uh, question uh, or related comment to this question. What about uh, road salt in the runoff? You do see some of that in the northern climates as well. Like, let's just say you're pumping water out of a retention pond uh, and all winter long the plows plow in the same direction, plow all the snow, all the salt in the same direction in the parking lot. And that happens to drain into the retention pond. So in springtime, you have a, a super high concentration of salt in, in your pond that you may be pumping out of for, for irrigation application. Um, to, to reduce salinity in water, you really have two options. You can blend it with, with the normal water source and until the ratio becomes acceptable or you can try and remove the salinity from the water. Removing salinity from the water involves reverse osmosis, which is very expensive um, and probably really not feasible uh, in a landscape irrigation application. Um, I think most people find that in the northern climates where that happens, um, they get enough rain in the springtime that dilutes the ponds to an acceptable level before they've even turned on their irrigation systems. Right, cool. Um, the last question, which I think you certainly touched on a little bit, but if you wouldn't mind just giving a, a very brief recap was how to account for extreme storm events because uh, it seems to be more and more frequent Sure. Let's go back to So um, if you have infrastructure piping that's let's just call it 24 inch pipe that's sized to handle a very large storm event. Um, what we see people do is upstream of the the pre-filters there will be some type of manhole or diversion structure so if you can picture in the photograph here on the right there being a a manhole right here the larger 24 inch pipe will come in and out of the manhole and head to the the main storm drain connection and you'll tap off of that manhole or diversion structure with the pipe size that you're sizing your pre-filters for. So let's just say that the manhole structure in the main pipe is 24 inch and, and designed to handle a, you know, a 12 inch an hour rain event over the roof area. But you're only going to size your pre-filters for an eight inch pipe, you know, which is a you know, 1.2 inch per hour uh, rain event over your roof area, you would tap off of that manhole structure and the main, the main outlet 24 inch pipe that would head to your storm drain would be at a slightly higher elevation or higher invert in that manhole structure so that it 
water would not go out of that pipe until your pipe to your storage tank hit its capacity and it couldn't flow anymore. So then the elevation would rise slightly in that manhole structure and then go out the invert of that main 24 inch pipe. Great. Yeah, I think uh, I think that kind of answers it and uh, or recaps it at least. And um, that's actually all the questions that we had for uh, today. We we did have a few people uh, asking about um, PDFs and and shooting across that uh, the GPM uh, formula that you mm -hmm. had mentioned earlier on. So, you know, all of those things I will uh, shoot over to you, and and you can you guys can kind of connect and and discuss further uh, outside of today but um, yeah that's that's all we had for today's webinar um, just before we uh, duck off for our Friday afternoons um, we are of course posting this webinar up on our website later today um, so if you need to rewatch it or pass it on to anyone else who couldn't make today's session um, it will be available to you um, in finishing up, I just want to thank Mike for his time in presenting today and, and getting this organized. Um, and to keep in mind that if you have attended and it has been mentioned that there will be a second part to his uh, presentation, which will go over you know, how to use that actual harvested rainwater and the components involved in that process. Um, this is, is currently slated for about March 20th, um, but of course uh, we will advertise it um, you know, the week leading to that presentation. Uh, so just keep an eye out on our newsletter and, and website. Um, but yeah, until then, thank you once again, Mike. Really appreciate your time and uh, everyone in attendance and have a great weekend. All right. Thank you, everybody.